Okay, welcome. Hopefully we have video. There we go. So welcome to creating a DSC or a, welcome to creating a PowerShell toolkit to demystify DSC. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Robbins. I go by Mike F. Robbins online. I'm a Microsoft MVP on Windows PowerShell, a Sapien Technologies MVP, leader and co-founder of the PowerShell user group, the Mississippi PowerShell user group, author of Windows PowerShell TFM 4th Edition, author of Chapter 6 in the PowerShell Deep Dives book, winner of the events category in the 2013 scripting games. You're not here to learn about me, but if you want to know more about me, see my blog site. I uh, blog every week. I've got about 400 blog articles out there. I've been blogging since 2009. And uh, get most of my hits from Google searches or Bing searches. And I get about 2,000 hits a day, so uh, that, that should tell you what type of content I have. Okay, so I've got some questions for the audience. This one thing of the sessions I've seen this morning, I'm not just going to get up here and preach to you because I want to know what level you guys are at before I start that. I don't want to talk over your head, but I don't want to talk underneath you as well. So how many IT pros do we have in the room? Okay. And how many developers? Okay, it looks like we've got a good mix of people in the room. So, uh, What I may have to do here is switch to, uh, I'm actually using a mini display port, and I do have uh, HDMI as well, so if this is going to be a problem. It looks like it's not going to come back this time, so let's try that. See, this is what happens in the real, wor real world. You, uh, you may plan for stuff all day long, but uh, it's generally the people who are good at plan B who are the most successful. So we're going to go with plan B. Okay. It's a little bit dimmer, but uh, it's better than no video at all. Okay, so how many people are using PowerShell version 4 or higher? Hopefully that's going to be everybody in the room. reasons I have some, uh, let's get back to where we were, there we are. So hopefully everybody here is writing functions, okay, and modules. How many people in the room are using desired state configuration today? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I uh, started with some questions because uh, I probably would have been talking over your head. I would have assumed that everybody in the room is using desired state configuration. It looks like we probably got less than half of the room who's using it. Okay, and how many people are familiar with public key infrastructure? Okay, if you're not familiar with that, you're going to use DSC. That's something you definitely want to invest some time in learning because uh, that's how you're going to prevent uh, putting passwords in your MOF configuration documents that are in plain text. And that was a capability that was possible in PowerShell version 4, but in version 5 you can actually encrypt the entire MOF document. So how many people are placing their PowerShell code in some type of source control system today? Good. I've, I actually see more hands than I expected. Okay, and how many people are using Pester or some type of unit testing for their PowerShell code? Good. These are things if you're not doing today, and definitely invest some time in doing them. It'll save you a lot of time down the road. So what about your, I want to talk a little bit about job responsibilities. You're here at the PowerShell Summit this week. So who is back on site doing your job this week? You know, if, if nobody has to be doing your job this week, then are you really needed, you know? And, and my question too is, do you really trust the people that are there on site doing your job? Now, hopefully you've automated the majority of your job, 
And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't worry about automating myself out of a job because if I do, then I'll just find another one and do the same thing again. So anyway, what this session's really about is when you figure something out, create a tool to accomplish that task. And then maybe you want to create some documentation. My documentation's my blog site. I left early Friday to take my wife out to dinner since I was going to be here this week. My boss calls me after work. He says, hey, you know that code you wrote to do X? Where can I find a copy of that? I said, I'll give you one even better than that. Just go to my blog site, put in this keyword. It'll be the only article that'll come up. It, you'll not only find the code to do what you want to do, but it'll walk you through it step by step. So that was the end of the conversation, and I was able to enjoy the rest of my evening. Instead of having to get in the system remotely or spend, usually, you know, most of these more complicated things you can spend twice as long on the phone with somebody trying to explain to them than just do it yourself. But once you figure out how to do something, write a tool to accomplish it. Because if you don't do something for six months, unless you're a lot smarter than me, then you're not going to remember the details of how to accomplish that task. But you write a tool, you figure it out once, you write a tool, you never have to figure it out again unless things change, like from version, PowerShell version 4 to 5 with DSC, there are some differences. And I've got some tools that it, I try to make my tools version agnostic, so it doesn't matter what version you're, you're using. Okay, so the content we're going to cover in this session, we'll briefly touch on all this. So we'll talk about uh, DSC, desired state configuration, we'll talk about the local configuration manager, push mode, pull mode, a little bit about DSC resources, some new features in PowerShell version 5 as far as DSC goes. We'll talk about functions, modules, tool making, automation. It's not a deep dive into any one of those topics, but that we'll touch on each one of those. So it's time for the, for the demo. Okay, and I'll give you an idea of what, what uh, the demo environment looks like here. Okay, so we've got four VMs that we're working with that are running on this laptop computer. They all have PowerShell version 5 on them. We've got a domain, they're, the servers, the three servers are running Windows Server 2012 R2, Server Core, no GUI, which is what you really should be running. Uh, GUIs don't belong on servers. If you do want to use a GUI to manage your environment or somebody on your team does, that's fine. But manage it from the desktop, not from, don't RDP into the server. So PC01 is a Windows 10 machine. That's, uh, they're all in the same domain. So for the purposes of this demo, what we're going to be working with is an SMB pool server. And for those of you who haven't worked with DSC, there's two modes of configuration delivery. Even if you haven't worked with it, you probably know this, but push mode and pull mode. And push mode is the default, and then NX, the, the uh, it results in immediate delivery and NX the configuration. This script is heavily uh, commented, and this script here is actually already on GitHub in my presentations repository. I uploaded it last night. I have some bonus content. I may not get to that, but uh, I've got to re-upload that one tonight. So I'm going to show you, uh, we'll just look at the root of the C drive on DC01. We've got one SMB file share already. And we've set the security on that as well. So domain admins has full control and domain controllers has read access. Now, one time I was setting my SMB shares for my DSC configurations and my resource resources. I was setting that to uh, so domain computers had read access. But believe it or not, not every computer in your domain is a member of domain computers. And specifically, domain controllers are not a main, uh, member of domain computers. So what I've done here, I've actually separated the environmental configuration from the structural configuration. And I'm not going to dive into that topic very much. It's the, what I recommend. But if you have questions about that, I actually have a very detailed blog article that I wrote for Power, PowerShell Magazine. You'll find a link in the, uh, in the code here. And then also, uh, there's a good article 
there's a lot of PowerShell documentation now on GitHub if you weren't aware, aware of that and you can actually contribute to that. But there's a specific article that, uh, that shows you how to do this as well. Now they're actually using a different uh, access control DSC resource than I'm using. I'm using uh, an SMB share DSC resource. I've got the links to GitHub. But the access control DSC resource was written by Ron Edwards and he spoke on that uh, on access control last year at the PowerShell Summit so you can find details about it on the YouTube videos. So what I'll do, I'll go ahead and define my, uh, my structural configuration which is the logic. And the, uh, the environmental configuration, I'm going to store that in a PSD1 file. I do want to show you something here. I'm going to change this just to something else, PSD2. Because I've seen, I've actually seen this written in some books that they say, hey, you could store this in a different file type. That's not true. Uh, so if I try to store the data in something other than a PSD1 file, now you can store it in a variable. And there are some benefits to store it in a variable instead of a PSD1 file. So if I try to run that, and actually that did work. So maybe uh, my testing was not valid. So let's do text. Or actually text. Yeah, so that did work. So maybe it was PowerShell version 4 I was testing that on. Okay, for the purpose of this demo, we're going to stick with the PSD1 file. And see, that's one of the things about PowerShell. If you think you know, nobody knows everything about it, but if you think you know everything about it today, then just wait till tomorrow because they'll change something. Okay, what I also want you to notice is how all this code I've showed you so far is formatted. So format your code for readability. You'll, your future, future self will thank you for it as well as your coworkers. And if you're looking for help online, you're going to paste your code. To be honest with you, me or, or nobody else, if we can't read your code, then you're probably not going to get any help. But if it's really easy to read your code, you're much more likely to get help. Okay, so I'll just show you the, uh, the PSD1 file that we created. That's what it looks like. It's actually a hash table, and then it's an array of hash tables for each of the, uh, each of the shares I'm going to create. One of these shares already does exist. Okay, we'll create the MOF configuration document, and we'll try to uh, apply the configuration with push mode. You'll notice we got an error message. So I was in Kirk Munro's session last, and he brought up a good point that read the message. You know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll uh, call somebody else over to get help from them, or even they'll run the, uh, they'll run the, mess the uh, command again, and they'll get the same error. But read the error message, because generally it'll tell you exactly what the problem is. And here, does anybody know why we got this error message? Can you highlight it for Okay. I'm actually... I'll light it. That, that's better. There you go. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, uh, it's because we don't have the DSC resources on the domain controller. And remember, we're running PowerShell version 5 here. So what are my options for getting my DSC resources on the domain controller? I'll open this up. So you can see those are the default, the default uh, modules, not necessarily DSC resources. But that's, that's the, the location I recommend putting your uh, DSC resources in. It's not the only option, but it's the all users module path. So with PowerShell version 4 and push mode, if I was running PowerShell version 4, my only option is pretty much copy and paste those modules out there. But with v5 and push mode, you can actually automate the distribution of, of resources, just like you can with pull mode. Okay, so we'll take a look at the uh, local configuration manager settings for DC01. You notice we have an LCM state of a uh, pending configuration. 
and that's because we, we tried to apply our MOF configuration document. I've also noticed that sometimes when you're in that state with PowerShell 5, you'll get this warning message. There's a commandlet called remove DSC configuration documents. We'll go ahead and run that. We'll check our, the state of our LCM again. And the main reason I wanted to show you this is that all our settings are the default. But you'll notice now, now it's actually idle and we don't get that message since we've removed that configuration we tried to apply. So what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna configure the LCM, the local configuration manager on DC01 for, uh, to pick up the, uh, the DSC resources from an SMB file share. Now one thing, there's actually a bug in this. You actually have to set a configuration ID even though it's not needed for a push mode. So we'll apply the MetaMoth. When you go to configure the local configuration manager, you actually get a MetaMoth file. And I don't know if you saw that here, but it says MetaMoth. So I'll query the LCM again. We'll actually query it here. So you'll notice we've got this resource module managers property now. So we'll drill down into that. We'll expand that property so we can see exactly what was set. So this is what was set. And then we'll take, we'll take one more look at it. Just grab the settings that I really want you to see. So DC01, we had to set a configuration ID because of a bug in PowerShell 5. And we have it set to a uh, UNC path. And we're still in push mode. So what we want to do, like I said, this is about tool making. So what if while you're here, your coworker needs to, to make a mod modification to your configuration management system? Do you trust them to take a DSC resource and put it in the proper file name? And the file name is going to be the name of the root module, it's going to be the version of the module, and then it's going to be zipped and it's going to be .zip. So that's Usually, even me, if I didn't have this created, if I haven't done this for like six months, I would have to look up, okay, what's the details of that? Or what I would do is go look at it and say, okay, what's one look like today? How did I previously do this? So the information that you need to create this is actually really simple. You can run get DSC resource, and I'll specify the two resources that we're using. So that one command will actually tell us the module name. It'll tell us the version. And those are the resources we're using under name. I'm not 100% sure in PowerShell 4 that it gave you the version because I actually, I actually used uh, get module to get the version with. So now let's, uh, in PowerShell 4, there, there wasn't a, uh, a compress archive commandlet, which they added in Vive. And I've actually read in several places where you couldn't use the .NET framework to zip the file, but I've been doing that and I've had no issues. Now you can actually use a com object as well. And I have an unzip, unzip file uh, function that, that'll actually check and see if the .NET framework is up to date. And if it's not, it can use com. So it's, it's down level to like PowerShell version two. But anyway, I'll just show you this function real quick. I'm not gonna walk you through all this, the details of these functions. This one here, of course, it's got comment-based help because if you don't have help, then how are people going to know how to use your, your functions? It requires a certain version of PowerShell. It includes uh, parameter validation and so on. So now if you're running PowerShell version 5, you don't have to resort to something like that. So to get the file name I was just telling you about is fairly simple. I'm going to show you what the file names would be for these two uh, DSC resources. And there they are there. They're uh, module name underscore the version dot zip. So all that information is very, very easy to uh, grab. But trying to figure that out manually is, is a challenge, especially this week while somebody else is trying to do it. So you also have to create a checksum for the zip file. And that doesn't matter if you're if you're putting the MOF configuration document out or if you're putting the, uh, the DSC resource out on the, uh, the file share or on a, a web server, you have to have a checksum and the checksum is actually how it knows that an update is available. So if 
I can't tell you how many hours that I've spent that I've updated a configuration or a resource and then I didn't regenerate the checksum. What happens is the server has a copy of the checksum, so it compares the two checksums. It says, oh, configuration's the same. So I have a couple more uh, functions here. So I've got one that publishes the, uh, the DSC resource to the SMB share. You'll notice all my, all my modules and all my functions I use the prefix minister for Mike Robbins, just so you know why that's there. When you go down, when you scroll down this one, you'll notice I'm using the uh, the new Mr. Zip file function. You could very easily use the uh, compress archive, and then also I'm using the, uh, the the new DSC checksum command. But what I try to do, I try to break. I showed you the new uh, Mr. Zip file command. I try to break my commands down so that uh, I'm not writing 500 lines of code in one file and I'm not duplicating that code between functions. I put, it in a, uh, I put it in a module and then if I call it with another function, then it just loads that function and uses it. So I consider that if you're duplicating data, that's real bad because you're creating technical debt for yourself. Now, redundancy of systems, like you want to have more than one domain controller on site, of course. But if you've got 50,000 copies of basically like the same database, that's really bad because one's going to get updated and then all the other ones are going to be out of date. So it's, it's kind of the same thought process with the, these uh, PowerShell functions. And I have another one called get Mr. DSC resource path that gets the path to the root module. So for creating a GUID, in PowerShell version 4, you didn't have a commandlet for creating a GUID. In version 5, you've got new GUID. So I'll show you the one that I created. It's very simple. So I can use this. Notice I've got comment-based help, even though it's very simple. That's it. <laughs> so, and I'll, I'll show you this. You know, a lot of times you find commands like that. So. Let's, let's take one, well actually we can still see it on the screen. Notice the built-in one in PowerShell version 5 is a function. So what that means, it's not compiled so we can see what the command looks like that they wrote. So mine was written before they wrote theirs, but of course we kind of accomplished the same thing the same way. So what we can see is, uh, we can see exactly how they uh, wrote their command. Let's make this a little smaller. So this is the SMB file share that we have defined for DC01. What we're going to do, we're going to publish the, uh, the resources to that location. So we're going to run this command, and you'll notice in the window they're going to show up. It's going to be zip files. It's going to be the right name, and it's also going to have a checksum. It wasn't that easy than figuring all that out manually. Okay, so now we'll look at the domain controller. This is the, uh, the location, and let me make this larger so you can see. So it's the C program files, Windows PowerShell modules folder. We're gonna pin this open so that uh, we can run a command behind it and still have that window open. We're gonna run the same command we ran before to apply this configuration to DC01. So what's gonna happen this time is it's actually going to pull those resources down from the SMB file server, even though we're in push mode. And that's, like I said, only available in PowerShell version 5. Okay, so I have another command that I wrote. I don't want to have to figure out how to get the, uh, which event log, there's only one event log enabled by default on DSC and there's a couple of other ones that are not enabled. So I just wrote a command that's a wrapper to uh, get one event to get the commands from the remote machine. And it, it has, a, I'm using an invoke command. So we'll go ahead and run this. One of the things I like without grid view in PowerShell 5 is you can do a control plus and make it larger. It'll tell you exactly what happened, that uh, those resources, you can see here the uh, PowerShell access control one was successfully installed. 
and it'll tell you the location. And with PowerShell version 5, you have a side-by-side -side versioning, so it puts it in a version folder. But the same command I could run on a V4 machine, and it would actually uh, put it, it wouldn't create a version folder. One thing I want you to notice here is that it says the PowerShell access control module was downloaded to this location, C1 to temp, whatever this temp file is. So every time you run this, your resources that are being downloaded are being downloaded into a temp file and that's not being cleaned up. So uh, if I go look at the temp file folder on uh, the domain controller, you'll notice uh, local time for me is 1.23 or 1.25 p.m. Two minutes ago we had this temp file show up and you'll notice that I've got like 50 million of these because I've run through this, this demo like 50 million times. So unless I go up there and manually <laughs> clean these up, then they're just going to keep building. Okay, so what, what did we accomplish with that, with that configuration? We actually created the, uh, the SQL and the web uh, SMB file share. Not only did we uh, create those, but we also set the security so that we have a SQL servers global group in AD that ha contains our SQL servers and that one has read access. And then we also have a SQL admins group that con contains our SQL admins that can configure those servers. So in this, in this scenario, just imagine that we have three groups of people. We've got domain admins who are doing the, the domain controllers. We've got SQL admins who are doing the SQL servers. And we've got web admins who are doing the, the web servers. Sure, go for it. Uh, for the SMB share uh, for your DSC resources on the full server, in push mode, is there a way to specify alternate credentials to get those resources? I, uh, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, on the LCM, you can configure all of that. You can configure the, uh, the credentials on the LCM, but I'm not sure it'll use those in push mode. So if you're in pull mode, I mean, you can do that. Uh, what I'll do, I'll actually test that after the session and, and we'll find out. Um, quick question. Sure. So um, if you're using partial configurations to kind of segment, uh, you know, which department is handling uh, uh, which configuration aspects on a given system, is there any way to define like an order of operation or um, a handle conflicts if they were to arise? Like, you know, set a precedent for like, okay, uh, uh, the server and a partial configuration will always trump whatever conflicts are posed by, you know, SQL DPAs or AD guys. It halts on conflict, doesn't it? You can do it depends on it. If it finds a conflict, it just stops. Really? That's what I've found. Is that a term? Yeah, it's a term. Yeah, it's term. That's what I found. Yeah. 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 Awesome. That's what I would think, too. I haven't actually tried that, but uh, <laughs> that's what I've been told as well. Yeah. I've, I've, we're going from four to five, so partials are still kind of new to me because there were no partials before. But from what I've seen is it will simply stop. And then uh, the other thing I've seen is most of the testing is on the LCM target, which makes it kind of hard to pre-test the partials to make sure they don't conflict. So it's kind of a, it's a juggling game, at least for me right now. OK, so uh, let's talk a little bit about pull mode. There's some new features in pull mode as well. So we have a SQL server. We have all the default settings. What we're going to do is set the local configuration manager so that it'll be in pull mode. This is actually compatible with version 4 and higher, although there is a new way to configure it in version 5. And the reason you need to know that is because when you're querying the local configuration manager, if you're designing a tool, you need to check both locations. If you're going to make your tool version agnostic, you want to check it to say, okay, is it set here? And then if it's not set, then go ahead and check it somewhere else too, you know, check it in the, the new location. Because the way you can configure this in V4, it's compatible with V5, so the machine could be set, set one way, and you'll understand. My point uh, will be a little bit clearer once we uh, get this configured. Okay, so we create the metamorph, we go ahead and set it on SQL 01. We take a look at the uh, local configuration manager. Now we're in pull mode, and we have this download manager name. 
and we have a source path up here as well. Usually you have to span these properties to see what's really set. So you can see, uh, you can see what's, it's a UNC path, but it's in a different location on the, uh, the local configuration manager. So let's take a look at the modules that are, the DSC resources that are installed on SQL 01. So you'll notice I've got one that I wrote probably a year ago that's called Seamister SQL Recovery Model. I'm going to remove that. So now you see it, now you don't. We're going to define a structural configuration for both DC01 and SQL01. This is the same thing we did earlier, except we're uh, defining one for two different servers, two different types of servers. I've got a lot of comments in here that we're going to gloss over. <coughs> But uh, like I said, this code is available already. I just want to look at, I want you to be able to see the specific settings. And I think this is actually the same thing I showed a, a couple minutes ago. So we did set a configuration ID and we set it to a refresh mode and the SMB path as well. So what we want to do now, we want to create a tool to, uh, to automate the deployment of my configuration files to the SMB share. So what needs to happen with that is, is the uh, MOF configuration document needs to be renamed to the configuration ID on the local configuration manager. And then we have to create a checksum, which, which I already mentioned. So I have a publish Mr. MOF to SMB tool. So if I take a look at that, it actually goes through, it checks several things. It checks to see if it's in full mode. If it doesn't, it generates a meaningful error message. It checks all these different locations that can be defined in V4 and V5. That way whoever's using this, they don't have to worry about, oh, we'll do this if it's V4 and do that if it's V5. Because especially if you're talking to a junior level engineer, the last thing, this is confusing enough as it is without having to know all the, manually know if it's V4 do this and V5 do that. Okay, so if we look at the uh, SMB share for the SQL servers, the neat thing about this one, it'll actually read the local configuration manager settings. So it'll get the configuration ID, it'll do it all for you. So you don't have to put anything in manually. The only thing we're doing is running the configuration to create the MOF files just like you would normally do. But then you just pipe it to the command I've created and it's gonna do everything for you and put it on the SMB share with the checksum and all of it. And if you give it more than one computer name, which I'm, I've actually given it to here, if you give it more than one computer name, if one is not in pull mode, it'll give you a meaningful error message, but it'll go through like 50 servers, and if it's got different settings defined in the LCM settings on those servers, it'll put it on the different shares. So when I run this, and you'll notice we got a meaningful error message, and you, I know you can't hardly see that, but that's for DC01, it's because we're still in push mode. So it stops and it gives the user of it, it says, hey, uh, DC01 is not in pull mode. So instead of them spending half a day troubleshooting this, but now we have our MOF configuration documents for the SQL server. And I'll just, uh, I'll highlight this again so you'll be able to see it. So, uh, the other thing we need, I'll show this one more time. So we use the same command before and this actually doesn't read the LCM settings, the command. We have to give it the SMB path. But my thought process with that is normally you're going to have a MOF configuration document per server. Now I know you can have a group of servers and you can actually use the same configuration for multiple servers. But with the resources, you're probably, you probably don't want to publish the resource for every single server because those are going to be, I might be using the, the PowerShell access control module for, for multiple servers and I don't want to constantly be publishing that out. So I'll go ahead and publish the uh, required DSC resource out to the share. I'll take a look at the module folder on SQL 01. In addition to that, I'll 
I'll take a look at the configuration folder on SQL 01 where the uh, pending MOF is going to end up. So you'll notice we have a previous MOF. We're going to end up with a pending MOF here in a second. We'll pin that folder as well. So we'll run update DSC configuration for SQL 01 to force it to pull the uh, the configuration and the DSC resource. So you'll notice now we have a, uh, a pending MOF, which will become current MOF once the configuration is successfully applied. In the background, this is having to load the SQL PS module because I'm setting a recovery model in some SQL Server databases with this resource. So that's why it took a little bit longer than normal. But now uh, you'll notice the current MOF was updated. So if the configuration failed to apply, it would still be called pending MOF. But also the, uh, the DSC resource was, was sent to the, uh, to the server. Okay. It's going to show the same thing in the, uh, in the event logs. Same thing as before. So there's nothing really new here to see. It's, it's putting the resources in the temp folder again. So with PowerShell version 5 for a pool server, there's a new location to configure the pool server settings for at least an SMB share. Well, I believe for the web server, for HTTP or HTTPS, there's a new location as well. Uh, I know, at least the way I just showed is, I know that uh, I could actually run, uh, what is it? Get, get DSC configuration. And here on a sim session, you can actually just give it a computer name. You actually don't have to give it a sim session. So you can run that. You can also run test DSC configuration. And in V5, you've got, a I believe, a detailed parameter on test DSC configuration that'll show you all the details, not just a true false. Quick question. If you're specifying a sim session with passing it a computer name, is it still going over WinRM, or is it? It's, uh, it's magic. What the? environments where you don't have decom. So what's going on under the hood? Is it reverting to decom, or is it WinRM because it says sim, but you're giving it? That's uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. I've got two things. I actually really enjoy blogging. It's probably one of the things I enjoy doing. So I've got two really good articles I'm going to write from questions in here. So keep them coming. I think it um, does a new does a new sim session with just computer name preferences. So if you're not if you don't need new credentials, it works by default. So you can see actually it says SQL zero one is it says it's false. And let's look at, let's say, uh, detailed. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm going to run this one more time. Yeah. So I'll have to research that as well because it says it's not in the uh, desired state. Okay, so what I want to show you now is is the uh, the DSC settings for an SMB pool server on PowerShell version five. Not sure where I left off, but it won't hurt if we run this again. So we'll create the meta mob, we'll apply it. And we'll actually, uh, it's called Configuration Download Managers. So we'll take a look at those settings. So what I'm going to do here is query all three servers and show the LCM settings. And I've kind of created custom properties here. So you'll, you'll see these are what I would call it. And actually, we've got one, well, we've got Web01 in there twice. So I didn't get an error message, so I'm going to run the command again. I don't know why we had Web01 in there. I've got gremlins today. Uh, you'll see there's there's like three different paths you would have to check, and we've got this pull mode for two of them, and then we've got a push mode for another one. 
So if you're pushing out like PSC resources, you would have to check all these different locations on the local configuration manager. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes, so I've got some bonus content. What I also do when I do a demo, just so you guys know, is I actually write code to undo everything I just did. So I can actually just highlight this region and we are done with this, so I can just run this. And with desired state configuration, I can actually put it back in the state it was before I started. So that way my demo is clean, I can run it again. Okay, so I'm on my base machine now. So this is uh, live stuff here. <coughs> Go ahead and import this module. It may take a second, and we'll set our, uh, we'll increase our font so people can actually see this. <coughs> okay, so the way I design my tools, I want to show you this Mr. DSC module. So, what I did, I ran a directory, a get child item on the directory that contains this module. So what I do, I actually break down all the functions into their own PS1 file, and the PS1 file is named the same thing as the function. I'm going to show you, uh, show you what the module and the module manifest looks like, and there's some issues you can run into with this. So uh, I have, I created a pester test, but it's not a standard pester test. I actually wrapped it inside a function and parameterized it, because it's a pester test I want to run on any module, and I don't want to duplicate that code. So when I run that test, it's actually going to go out and test and make sure that all the files in that folder match the functions to export on the module manifest. So I'll show you what that, so this is what the pester test looks like. It's actually a function and I can feed it a, a module manifest path and all it does, I can give it multiple so I can use my like entire Git repository and have it go through every folder in there. And it'll make sure that I haven't left out any PS1 files that, that are functions that should be exported and that everything lines up. So create tools to create your tools with. So what my uh, module manifest, this is what my PSM1 file, so this is where you would normally have your functions. So the only thing I'm doing is going through and dot sourcing all my functions. And uh, I know June Blender recently wrote a blog article that's somewhat related to this on the Sapien blog, so definitely take a look at that. So if you look at my uh, module manifest, what I've found is you actually have to specify all the functions in the module manifest when you're doing this, because if you use some sort of logic, the, uh, although it'll work if you manually use import module and import that module, it won't auto import if it's in the, uh, if it's in the PS module path. The commandlets won't be available. And also, if you upload it to the PowerShell gallery, it won't show the commandlets in the list. Have you thought about writing something to just build that module every time you update the function? Uh, yes. <laughs> so what I have here, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually going to copy a command from an old version of my Git repository. And by the way, uh, in September, I'll be doing a tech session webinar for PowerShell.org on Git and using Git with PowerShell, and you can do all your stuff right from one interface in the PowerShell IC. So anyway, uh, now that I've copied another PS1 file, notice it fails because we're expecting, and you can't see that, so uh, we're expecting we're expecting eight functions to be exported and only seven are imported because I copied a PS1 file in there. So I actually have a function that I can run that will give me a list of all the uh, base file names, which, by the way, are the function names. And there's a problem with update module manifest in PowerShell version 5 where I could automate the entire thing. But what I can do, I have to do a little bit of copy and pasting, but I can pipe that to clip.exe, and then I can open the module manifest, and I can actually paste it right here in uh, functions to export because that's kind of a pain in the butt to, to uh, update. So then I can save it. And I can test my, uh, run my test again. What my test does, my test actually does a force on uh, importing the module to make sure you've got the current one. What about like helper functions, the little assistance you do that might propagate across multiple functions? 
you keyword those so you can exclude them from the scan? Or? My tools, I normally don't have any private functions, but what I've seen some people do is create two subfolders and they'll have private in one folder and public in another. And then that way they can control how, uh, what's, exposed what's exposed. Now one thing I am doing is, uh, one thing I am doing, and I'll just tell you what I'm doing, I'm actually, uh, when I do get child item to get the list, I exclude pester test and profiles. Because I had an issue one day where I was, uh, I had a problem with a profile and it's because I kept importing the, uh, the profile. So you'll notice that's here. So I'm excluding those. Uh, so now if we run our test again and we actually, that's where we're at, we just ran that. So I wanna show you one more little issue he here. It's really common when you're writing functions You'll, you'll say uh, modules, PS, desired state configuration, or whatever the module is. Oh, cannot type. So I don't type in demos. We'll get it here in a minute. Okay, so it's really common to do that because things I'm doing are gonna require uh, the PS desired state configuration module. So if I go back and import that again, now I want you to notice that I've got some commandlets listed. Well, I don't have any commandlets in my function. Well, the thing is, when you write your code like this, you'll end up with anything that you're telling, uh, I'm gonna run this test again. Notice the test failed again. But you don't want to uh, use required modules in your uh, functions if you're breaking them out. You actually wanna use, uh, if you go up to the uh, module manifest, I've actually got a, a uh, example here and we're just about done. As you can see my cleanup is there. So in my uh, PowerShell toolkit that I have, I'm actually uh, using required modules. So I have Hyper-V, Pester, PoshKit, and PowerShell Community Extensions. So that's what you wanna do instead. So you notice in all my functions, I actually say, hey, if you're using this separately, then add this line, and I put that in as a comment. Because somebody can go, come grab one of my functions and add it to their toolkit without having to grab the whole module. So uh, we'll jump back to the slide deck real quick, and then we'll be done. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, has been on the PowerShell team for the past 10 years. That uh, we wouldn't be here today and we probably wouldn't have as good a job as we have if it wasn't for the PowerShell team. We'd still be a click next admin. Okay, I've got a slide of resources here. This, this uh, slide deck is on GitHub already as well. So uh, PowerShell.org, that's why you're here today and there's a whole list of stuff. And there's my contact info and that's the last slide. Thank you guys. SMB stuff, you basically have no reporting anyway, you know? Well, you, with push mode, you can still tell us the report the status to the full server. So that's what we're doing, but it's not, there's not really a good, there's no built in interface to actually view that then. Kill this before I go to the bathroom. <laughs> No,
we had a few little technical difficulties down there. Thank you. <laughs>